It's Tuesday, May 15th, 2012. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, do you have the Buddha nature? Let's do this. So uh, I've been a pretty hardcore biker, like, my whole life. Like, I've had, you know, from when mm. I was a pretty young kid, I got a real, like, 10-speed bike, and then I got a mountain bike, and I've been mountain biking and trail riding well, and I mean, everything. you know, relatively hardcore, right? Because actually hardcore are those guys with the Lance Armstrong get-ups, right? Going well, Scott, they're real not, they're, fast, they're, they're, right? So, That's hardcore. Well, That's, Scott, there's other kinds of hardcore. I mean, there's also the, like, hardcore, like, trick biker on those BMXs, but it's yeah. almost a like, totally different class. Like, you have to diverge. You can't be hardcore Lance Armstrong and hardcore like downhill mountain biker. Uh, there are guys who are, but um, some name one. Who? I'm who? sure there has to be somebody. You're just saying, right? But the point is, you know, we're like a step under that. You're well, we, not... I, I, my whole, I'm just saying, my whole. Regardless life, of your direction, there's the matter of degree of hardcore. I'm just saying, relative to most people, like from a young age, you are I, hard. Yes, we are in we both harder core than the vast majority of people. Uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I'm a lot harder core than you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so I've been like I've been biking a lot. Like I used to go biking, like mountain biking, almost every day after school and like middle school and high school. And just in off what into the mountains woods. in flat as Detroit? Uh, mountain biking also refers to like single track and uh, track technical and trail riding and all Where that. Where were there? What tracks were you riding on? Uh, you Detroit. realize there's tracks in most of the woods. And I didn't actually live in downtown Detroit by the time I was in middle school. I lived in New Baltimore and then Sterling Heights, where there's tons of single track trails. But uh, one thing, like trail and mountain biking, I never, like, I knew there were clips, like toe clips, and I knew there were, you know, pedals that had built-in clips, but I didn't know what that all was because I never did, like, I never had a road bike because or Because you weren't bike or maximum anything. hardcore. You're well, no, because I only did, the hardest I only did, like, trail riding and mountain biking and stuff, so I only had I'm a mountain I'm pretty sure bike. mountain bike guys have that, too. Uh, yeah, so back then... Uh, basically all the people I rode with, none of them used that stuff because the people who taught me were like, no, it's too dangerous. You're better off just going for it. You only need those if you're, and they all, they'd all list like a different list of reasons you'd need clips or clipless, but their lists never matched up. <laughs> and I never really did like hardcore downhill, which is kind of separate. So I didn't really need like those spe special bikes or anything. I always preferred like, you know, a hardtail mountain bike. But uh, so clips never really uh, factored in. But now that I moved to the city, you know, I got my first street bike, and I've been riding on streets and roads as opposed to in the woods, and it's a way different ball game. Like, it took me a while to get used to not having a suspension, uh, though I kind of like how much faster I can go. But uh, I took the plunge, and I got some clipless, like, SPD pedals, and I got the fancy shoes and all that stuff and got them installed, and pretty much everyone on the internet, and even in the bike shop, they're like, yeah, you're going to fall over at least, like, two times before you figure it out. I haven't fallen over yet. Yeah, I can't imagine you would fall over. Uh, yeah, right? so here's the here's what right? they like said. you might be like, "Oops," and stop and stand on the ground. Uh, no, you no. So stand on the ground. That's the problem. Apparently, what happens to most people when they use the, these sort of like clipless systems? They for the get first them time, both clipped in, and they can't unclip, and then uh, they no, just fall over. You forget to unclip right away. Like you don't have the instinct of unclip before you come up to like a stop sign or like basically you get this instinct of whenever there's possibly trouble, you unclip a foot to be ready. Mm. But if you don't have that instinct, like say you're riding, right? And say you suddenly come to a stop or you just come to a stop and you weren't really thinking about it. If you're clipped in and you lose all forward momentum, it is too late to continue pedaling. And usually it's too late to actually clip out in time. And what, what one set website described, uh, the exact words were, you will have what I can only refer to as the most ungraceful graceful, and doofy-looking accident anyone will ever see. <laughs> to the outsider, I it will appear as though you are falling over in slow motion due to your own stupidity, when in fact there is nothing in the world you could do to arrest your fall. I can definitely imagine both seeing this thing from seeing someone else do this and also being victim of it. I can imagine it in its fullness. It almost happened once where I was stopping and I was almost at a stop and I was thinking like, gonna unclip, gonna unclip. But I was also thinking, I can kind of wait. I think I got this. And then I came to a complete stop and I started to like unclip. And I couldn't get it out like right away. And I started to lean a little bit and then I felt it. And once you're falling over That's and it. you are clipped in, you're fucked. I, Too I, late. No, I got my foot out and I Beyond stood. Beyond the point of no return, the I, center of gravity is I open. got my foot out. I was like 
one degree to the right from <laughs> being past that event horizon and <laughs> being that guy. But even the bike shop guys are like, yeah, you're going to fall over a bunch. But so far, I haven't, and I'm really proud of that. See, the thing is, right, is I know for a fact that if I got that, I would be so conscious of it. Like, it would be, you know, I would be paying attention to it so much. Oh, yeah, the danger. I might get into an accident from something else. Ah. Right? Like, I'd be paying attention like my feet are attached. I just bump into a car, who knows what, or get doored or whatever, right? But I would be so conscious of it early on that I wouldn't wouldn't fuck it up because I'd be so much paying attention to it. And then after that period of so much paying attention to it, it would it would become reflex before I would stop paying attention to it. So the only risk is if there's an in between period where I'm not. It's not quite a hundred percent, you know, motor reflex yet. But I'm, I've done it enough that I'm not super paying attention to it all the time. Yep. And that's the danger zone. Now, I do. Not when you're first using it, but when you're sort of getting used to it, but not 100% yet. I would recommend getting them because now that I'm riding with them, and I was using toe clips before, and even that was a huge improvement. Though toe clips, I'm not a fan of toe clips. Well, here's the thing. Toe <laughs> clip, one, when I was a punk kid, too, I couldn't afford like a clipless system. Also, that was you know 20 years ago when I started doing this stuff. But uh, toe clips mountain biking are... A death warrant. <laughs> I think they're a death warrant, period. Well, no I've been, what I've been of, using them in maybe the city the, up to this maybe point. Maybe track biking, they're okay. No, 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 no. They're okay in the city, I would say. They're not okay in the woods because, one, if you I mean, get, in the velodrome, they're okay. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but when I think track, I think, like, single track, like, you know, I'm the saying two-inch on a, trail I'm saying the on the circle where the guys are trying to not go on their fixies. Yeah, the kind of biking I would do. That's like, track biking. Like, in the woods. All right, so I pull my foot out of the toe clip. And I ride on the back. Now I've got this basket that's just waiting to catch a tree. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's like night and day in terms of like like speed. I tire well, you myself know, out Well, faster. first of all, you know that your foot is always in the right spot. Yep. You also, when you're biking, you're forced to pull up, right? You don't have to like, you know, bend and sort of curve your foot to sort of get some pulling up going on. So that muscle that does the up pulling is now getting worked all the time as you're pedaling. Yep. So and I find you're going I, way faster. I find I tire faster, but I'm going a lot faster while I'm tiring faster, yep. and it's, it's a net yeah. gain. I would get them, but I would only get them if I had the fancy kind of well, Scott, you know, road bike. I wouldn't is, put them on a non-road bike. Uh, just get them, and you can just take pedals off. Like, I got my old pedals. You can just swap pedals between bikes. It's yeah, trivial. I still I would. I don't think it's worth it. It's like it's like yeah, it's like putting a big fancy engine in sort of a boring car. It's like Scott, yeah, I'm not thinking worth I'm it. thinking about getting them for my old mountain bike now. Yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, well, you don't have an old mountain bike. <laughs> Even if I did, I would only get them if I had you know the the you know the road Tour de France style hooked handlebar lean forward kind of bike. Then I would absolutely get them, no question. The other big thing they save you from that. Uh, I have never done to myself, and I might but get I've that seen kind of people bike. do it, is mountain biking, if you're going like long distance, like an overland, like this long thing, you get kind of fatigued. And it's really easy to just kind of be tired when you're like going on a straightaway and your foot will just like slip off the pedal right into the wheel at the back. That never happens to me. Yeah, because you haven't, if, try riding like, if you ride a very long distance, it's actually a fairly common accident to happen. Mm -hmm. And clipless systems prevent that. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I'm digging these things. Uh, that's all I can say about it. I didn't get multi-release because research said that that's basically stupid. What is multi-release? You So you can unclip. Do so you unclip by twisting your, kicking your heel out to the side? Yes, out and to that, the left or right. Right. Well, so multi -release, away, away from the bike, generally. Yes, multi -release, you don't kick your heel towards multi -release, the bike. Multi-release, you can clip in both directions, or you can do a maneuver to clip straight up, but you have to use enough force to get off. So it gives you more options out. Yeah. Multi-release appears to be used more for mountain biking kind of clips, and there's all these. I learned a whole bunch about this stuff. I did my research. I researched research. it as well. There's the kind. The SPD is pretty much the one to get. Yeah, don't That's get anything. That's the one else. that built that they can. In, you can put that on any normal shoe. Well, any sh there's like a you know normal looking shoes, right? Like they have dress shoes that have SPD brackets on them. Yep. And you well, can actually walk around right with an SPD clip in the shoe if the shoe has enough sole that it goes lower than the clip. Yep. Which is a lot. You know, you could also get one where the clip sort of sticks out a little bit and you can't walk around too much, but you can still kind of walk around. Yeah, for my kind of riding, those are stupid. Right, but there's the non-SPD ones. Well, there's you have look, like a big bracket. And there's a couple of old like, ones. Yeah, I see guys in the city with these. They have these giant brackets on yeah, the bottom of the Yeah, all the research the says that not only are most other systems worse or dangerous, 
but many of them are bad for you. Yeah, it's like the, it's like the old-fashioned clipless system is like there's a gigantic bracket on the bottom of your shoe. You can't really walk at all, you know, and it, it's a special it's only on a special shoe and it's like, yeah, who who wants that? You know, maybe if you still have it from well, the Well, I realized days. the play is important cuz one used to mountain biking so much, what I realized I do that I never noticed until I start until I started riding like this is that I tend to twist my like I stand up a lot. And I tend to twist my torso around a lot, like to the side, especially around corners. And it's kind of a like mountain bikey thing that you don't need to do in the city. But now that I'm clipped in, like I notice every time I do it because my foot can't move that way. Yep. Yeah, I don't. I try not to stand up unless absolutely necessary. Yeah, well, it's a different kind of like standing up on a mountain bike is basically a suspension if you have a hard tail. Like if there's a big hill, I get a downshift so I can stay sitting while going up the hill rather yeah. than stand up and go. Eh, eh, but eh. like, if, like you know, mountain biking, you're going over really rough terrain. You stand up to go over the rough. Well, because otherwise the seat is gonna kick your ass. Literally. Yeah, unless you have a full suspension, and I actually still prefer hard tails to full suspensions. Granted, I don't do, you know, like crazy, like downhill on a ski slope. Oh, so you're not the hardest core is I'm, what you're saying. I uh, never said it was the hardest no, core. I'm, I'm, just I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty hardcore biker, though. <laughs> okay. So what do you got? It's Newsday. News. Tuesday. So check this news out. I'm checking. Right. So Portal 2 is coming out with this thing called Perpetual Testing Initiative, which is a way for you to make your own portal test chambers. And the thing is, there have been many... FPS map makers in the past, all the way back to Z Doom, even Wolfenstein 3D, you could make your own maps, right? Yeah. But start when things got 3D, when things got Quake, when things got Half Life, and they had tools like what was it called, Hammer or something? Yeah. Well, I mean, I used to mod the living, ever living crap out of like Doom, and, you know, the Unreal map I, making I had thing. Windu and right. dehacked and wadded and all even that stuff. Even NS2 has some really good map making tools, but all these tools for making, you know, FPS maps are difficult tools, right? They're, you have to spend a lot of time learning them and fiddling with them, and you learn to apply textures yeah, well, and make models. Well, here's the difference. It took me and... a few weeks to learn in my spare time to learn how to make like complex Doom maps. Like, and this really is Doom. The yeah, this Doom. isn't real 3D. This is Doom. And so, but I, it meant I could casually make mods for Doom and levels for Doom while doing other things. But most of the people I know of who make like Half-Life, like Counter-Strike maps... That's it. That is their hobby. Singular. Yeah, because it's you know it's all you get so hard. You have to. It's like a whole. Si you, you have to get. That's why like level editor is a job. If As you, an aside, if, if you learn to there, like make maps for the Unreal Engine, you got a job for life. Because you know the same way that a guy who learns like AutoCAD is a job for life. Anyone who needs someone who can work, you know. I have an aside, Scott, that you'll appreciate. We I want to get this out there. If any of you listeners feel like you could take an old Counter-Strike 1 Sisk map <laughs> called CS Thunder. It's not the one that's called CS Thunder in Source. It doesn't exist in Source. It's CS underscore Thunder. It was perhaps the best Counter-Strike map ever made. At least our favorite. Yes. Because uh, it had this great... Well, at, I digress. As to, I could do a whole show on why that we map We should was get great. make a server that only runs Thunder. And the version of 1.6 that supports it? Is State. Assault, oh, estate. Assault. Which assault? There's a couple assaults. Uh, oh, no, I, no, I no, 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 not assault, not assault. Uh, oil rig. Uh, I want I want that APC. <laughs> I want vehicles back, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeepathon what, 2K? Mansion? Jeepathon 2K. Jeepathon 2K. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just only the crazy Wait awesome a minute, maps. wait a minute. More people. Oh, and uh, uh, Arab... <laughs> I'll bet. You know what? I'm going to check after the show because uh, CS16 is played as much as CS Source. There's got to be a server running Jeepathon. And if there is, I'm going to play on it fucking tonight. <laughs> Good luck with that. But I digress. If you can make that map in CS Source anyway, or CS Go, I'll pay you. This portal map maker is, gonna, is looking, is so brain dead easy that anyone can do it. It's because it, Portal only has so many elements, right? So it's really easy for them to provide you with this other user interface where you just sort of you lay tiles, you know, and you put like, okay, a bumper there and a companion cube there and a automatic portal there. And, you know, so, so, and to make test chambers, you know, put the exit here, put the entrance here, right? They provide an easy user interface to building a test chamber and then it automatically generates the map based on that. So I haven't read much about it yet, so I have a question for you that I don't know if you can answer because I don't know if it's known. Mm -hmm. And I have a, a proposal for what I would do making maps if I were a dick. Impossible to win maps? No, I would make maps that are impossible but seem 
so possible. Right. Like, so this you is feel like it's your fault that you're not making it. Right. So here's the thing, right, about this is that it's really hard to make a good test chamber. Crazy hard because a good test chamber, right, is one that is possible, right? Uh, but not trivial, but is not obvious either, right? It's like Dixit. You can't be obvious, but you can't be impossible, right? You need someone yep. to get, right? I mean, even Portal 2 sort of suffered, in my opinion, for me as a gamer. Note I'm qualifying that. Because parts of for it the were fact either that too obvious. The whole second half of the game was no thought. I literally, no matter what the puzzle was, I'd ignore the puzzle, I'd look around the room, and if there was any angled surface, I would assume that was the answer, and just accelerate into a portal coming off of that. And that always worked. Right. In the co-op, I think there was one that took us a little while to figure out. Uh, and the th other thing in Portal is that in addition to the puzzle solving, there's the acrobatic component, which is like, okay, it's, you know what to do, but can you do it? Ah, uh, there's a third element of timing puzzles. That's what I'm saying. Which, that's the well, acrobatic no, no. component. I would say they're separate because there's the acrobatics of, for ex of your own personal timing, like... Do I have to like fall through multiple portals well, and then like, shoot a portal shoot, somewhere shoot else? Shoot the cube, then jump through the portal at the right time and make sure that you can make the jump and grab yep. the cube in But there's another kind of puzzle. Remember those those the spheres of light in the portal one where you might have to time it where it's there's an element independent of you, like a rotating door or something you have to time against. Right, but anyway, I consider them two separate aspects. The of reason the puzzle. there are few, so few puzzles in Portal One and Two is because using only the elements that they had available to them, right? There's only it's really hard to come up with another puzzle that's actually good. So that they had noticed they as they get later in the game. You know, it's like, why didn't they add another one? Well, they really couldn't until they introduced the goop and the paint because they ran out of good puzzles using only cubes and buttons, so they had to add the paint in there. And then once they added the paint, well, it's like, well, we can only come up with so many using the paint, we need to add something else in order to come up with more puzzles. So using only the elements that currently exist, I'm, you know, and having only these amateurs make new test chambers, I am incredibly both skeptical and excited i'm excited for i know there's going to be at least a few really good test chambers that come out of this but i'm skeptical because i know most of the test chambers that come out of this is going to be absolutely worthless the other trouble is that easily two-thirds of my enjoyment of portal is from the humor which won't be there in these i mean unless i, can... I think there will be some in like you know parts of it but not really yeah like unless i can script like add wave files and yeah do it's dialogue like where, is it gonna let i don't think it's gonna let people make like a whole campaign it's only gonna let people make a test chamber and then like share your test chambers with your friends and that i'll admit i haven't looked into it at all because i've been busy playing other games but what i'm curious if they'll do because some of the old Doom editors had things that would tell you if something was possible or not for a player who wasn't cheating. What do you mean? How could something be impossible in Doom unless there's like a key door and you haven't put the red key anywhere uh, yet? You can trivially make things that are impossible to get past. How so? Uh, you can make a stairway, you just can't go down, and that's the only path to the exit. Yeah, but that's just, that's like I said, that's just an obstruction. That's, it's really easy. To you could make a lava pit. Any, any basic pathfinding algorithm can determine if it's impossible to get from point A to point B. Yes, it's a little complicated, Portal though. is, 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 you can't really have a, you know, a thing that does that, because it's like, well, okay, so to get from point A to point B, there's a door that needs to open. There's a button that controls the door. What can push the button? The, it's, it would be a ludicrously difficult problem to come up with a program that could determine if a test chamber Which was would, solvable. however, be a much more interesting problem for someone who was interested in this sort of thing to try and yeah, solve. If there was some because AP the number of elements of Harmony are constrained and the physics are very well known and the you know the, uh, there's so many constraints that one, you could come up with a sort of brute force thing that would run around, like it spawns a million dudes who go, ugh, in every possible direction. Or two, you could have a sort of best guess algorithm that could figure out, I wonder if someone could make a thing for a small map that would be able to determine if it's possible at all or impossible. And then a secondary threshold of if it's possible without, quote, ridiculous timing and or acrobatics. Yeah. I think, you know, my idea, I've got one idea for a chamber, right? And basically the idea for this chamber, it's a very loose idea. And I think it's the only hope I have of making a good chamber. Uh -huh. Is you got to open the exit door. But you also got to get to the exit door, right? This is sort of the fundamental thing in Portal, right? So I'm going to make it to where it's sort of obvious. You can just go boom, 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 and it'll open the door. But if you do that obvious way of opening the door, 
you won't be able to get to the door. And if you do the obvious way, it'll be really easy to get to the door. But if you do that obvious way of getting to the door, you won't be able to open the door. And there'll be a non-obvious way of doing both simultaneously. I kind of want to go more the route of making something really sort of like puzzle in the sense of find the secret doors. Well, like that's the other school. thing. I, it's the other idea I had that I realized was kind of a bleh idea because it would be sort of easy is make your test chamber kind of crazy and maze-like and like you got to, you know, find the hidden spot that doesn't look quite right, shoot a portal there, get into the secret porn room and that's where the cube is that you need to get through the, you know, so it's like people would just be sitting there like, arg and eventually find it. Well, what I would do is make one like that and then publicize it as the impossible one and dare people to send you a video of them beating it. And a guy's going to beat it in five seconds. Oh, exactly. But the Because he's going to look at the map file and he's going to say, oh, there's a room there. Yeah. And he's going to look around. He's going to see it. And I mean, if, you, if I gave that to you, you would find it in like no time. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not like you can make something that's, you know, a completely sealed room, right? Because there's no way to shoot the portal into it. Right, it would have to be, you know, like a far away, distant thing that's very tiny. But you would notice it because you would be. Looking Maybe I'll at go the route of making a straight up maze. Yeah, but any maze, you would find it by always going left. You, uh, Scott, you can construct mazes where that does not work. Really? How's uh, I could show you some examples. There, there are ways to make mazes where the left or right always rule will trap you in a loop. Mm. That'll never touch the solution. Uh -huh. Like it's trivial to make a maze like that. Uh huh. Maybe you should make a maze like that, where the left, we're going always left, traps you in a loop. Going always right traps you in a loop, and you know, going a certain. If you go the right way, which is neither always going left or always. You should going have right, said the correct way. If you go the correct way, that won't actually bring you to the goal. It'll just along that g correct path. There is a spot where you can see a place to portal that will get you to the right spot. So even it, and it won't be at the very end of the correct path. It'll be somewhere else along the correct path, and you might miss it. I don't know. Oh. You can see why this is difficult, but I'm I'm excited to see what happens with this. So in other uh, more rumoring news, there was an article a while ago that Valve was reportedly working on a Steambox game console. That's been a rumor for a zillion years. Yeah, but there was a recent iteration of it in March. And there was another more recent article uh, from April talking about how Valve is straight up trying to hire hardware developers. Well, they could be making anything. They could be making anything, but uh, the second one put forth a wave of speculation. Speculation. <laughs> so Talk I think it's interesting jokes. because Valve is one of the few companies, like I can count on one hand, the number of companies in the world that I generally trust to do the things I want personally and have, if not my own best interest in mind, at least a personal self-serving interest that will also serve my own personal interests. That's right. Valve also is a pretty great company, it appears, in light of their uh, employee handbook. Yeah, apparently uh, there was a small interview with uh, Gabe Newell he, and in that interview, he, A, basically admitted that that policy of the flat company was a direct reaction to his time at Microsoft. He wanted to do the opposite. Nope. And B, he 100% just said he likes My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. That's a good sign of a good person. Because we knew that for a while, but he just said it straight up. So, there you go. So, uh, all this together, uh, I want to just kind of take an aside to talk about something that I'd said a long time ago on the show like many years ago, but I think the consoles as we know them today have to die, and it won't be that long. Well, be, be, well the, but the thing is, the reason it might not happen is that Microsoft actually holds all the cards here, not so much the other console developers, and not so much people like Valve, because Valve could make their own thing. I mean, you know, the rumor was Valve's going to make a set-top box, which would be great. Valve should do something like that. Mm, and maybe. I think so. But Microsoft is the one who way back before the Xbox even was saying that they wanted to make video game consoles be a commodity hardware. Because they thought they would all run Windows. <laughs> which Windows is still really the only way to play games right now. That's right. But uh, so Microsoft had a vested interest in that. And everyone who plays games called the idiots and like really defended the virtues of consoles and how Microsoft is trying to be evil, and it was this whole stupid argument. 
PlayStation, I don't see any like future for their hardware. Nintendo posted it's not in this country. Nintendo posted losses, like big losses. Nintendo's Huge. run into a lot of trouble. I heard a rumor that Nintendo and also sort of based on information from like a Nintendo financial report or something or a quarterly report that they're actually going to bring that they've been selling the 3DS like at low price and they're going to bring the price back up. I saw that rumor. I don't think it'll actually happen. Uh, I think that is crazy. Yeah. Bringing the price up, it's like, whoa. We could do a show on Nintendo. What the fuck? The thing is, like, um, you know, Scott, remember Geek Nights circa 2005? I remember we did a show. Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. PCs we said, died. Yeah, we're like, Nintendo is the champion of everything. At the time, it was true. PC gaming is dead. Well, that, that, it was at the time. Well, Scott, Very at the time, dying. let's see, what was going on at the time? What, oh, right, GameCube. Yeah, you know, Wii was coming, and we actually believed it was going to be a revolution. The DS yeah. was the king of everything. But it's an aside. Nintendo, basically, to avoid doing an entire show on this, Nintendo turned its back on the so-called, I hate this term because it's a useless term, but the hardcore gamers, like super serial gamers like us. The thing is, Nintendo, if they would just change their ways, they could con reconquer the world oh, so easily. fast. All they just do Pokemon is Pokemon like, MMO. Yeah, Pokemon MMO, That's right? That's number one, right? One, Num number one, that would do it. They could make a company that was just the Pokemon MMO. They already do. It's called the Pokemon Corporation. <laughs> yeah, but, but they, anyway. that company made the MMO. <laughs> but number two, just open up, be like, hey, Anyone who wants to can make games for Nintendo systems. We're removing all our DRMs. Indie developers, we don't care who who it is. Anyone who wants to can make a Nintendo uh, no, game. No, it couldn't be just that anymore. Why not? So Nintendo turned its back on the Four Swords, Crystal Chronicles, experimental hardware, Game yep. Boy, Link Cube stuff. To target well, they want to do the Wii U, no, 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 which is going the, back to that. Yeah, let me finish. To target the Blue Ocean, which was so-called, again, terrible term, casual gamers and mommies and all that. But they targeted them by still selling them expensive games, which they was gotta also sell where the all games the that's other no, thing. No, they got to sell no, the games no, for a dollar. Which was $50. also where all the money was on the DS and the Game Boy Advance and everything. But that meant that the next wave of gaming, like smartphones and Angry Birds, is they're not, basically they did the thing that you should never do. They went toe to toe with the dollar games. <laughs> we used to say, yeah, Zynga, that doesn't compete with, you know, what we consider games. They're yeah. barely a game company. Nintendo's trying to sell you Angry Birds for 50 bucks. It's not going to work. Yeah, so Nintendo basically went after a demographic and then got creamed in that demographic while simultaneously literally abandoning the people who would give them hundreds of dollars sight unseen for a console that might fail that has one game available. I bought the DS... Literally knowing nothing about it day one. Well, we had the Virtual Boy strategy. Yeah. The thing is, I'm actually, there's enough games in the 3DS that it's almost something I want. To wait for the 3DS Lite for. Right, but even then, it's like, I have so many games already. Why? You know, it's like, even though there's some games in the 3DS I kind of want, and there's supposed to be like a Phoenix Wright that's going to be 3DS only, and stuff like that. It's like, even though there's maybe enough games in there, the cost of it, even at the low price now, is not worth it. They have to pump it up so much more to make me pay for it. But for Nintendo, uh, it's not just open up, but it's open up with what the GameCube had. Have hardware like the Game Boy Link thing, or connecting 3DSs to a Wii, or right? Wii U because or nobody is gonna. If I'm can, if I'm developing a game and I can develop a game for any platform I want, why would I? Even if Nintendo is open and will you know let any game go in the the store, right? Why would I go on? And why would I spend all this time you know learning Nintendo's platform which when is I can just make every other an platform? XNA kind of game right? or a Valve game? The only reason I like would Steam. do it is because the Nintendo platform has stuff, has hardware, has accessories, has things that no other platform has. I right? mean, like Crystal Chronicles and Four Swords were like this amazing new concept, yeah. and they made some like demos, like, hey, look what you could do. I would make a game for Nintendo if it meant that I could make a game that was not possible on any other platform, because I know that every single person who has that platform has these particular accessories that go with it, like the Wii U with its extra screens, or the 3DS with its 3D, or the DS with its two screens and touching, right? Yep. And that's the only, that's the thing. So if they opened up, they would attract developers for those reasons. Because you know, I can make a game on the PC, sure, but you can't make a game on the PC that is four DSs attached to the television. So if you got an idea for a game like that, well, Nintendo's the only game in town. But 
it, now this won't happen because there are you know there's Nintendo's Japanese and stubborn. Oh no, even my thing of if Microsoft pushed it and worked with Valve straight up and they actually not gonna have put aside corporate bureaucracy, they could I think literally destroy the console market to the point that commodity hardware gets released every five years that is just, you know, this is the spec. If you have the spec, any game for this, you know, joint Valve, XA, whatever venture will run on it with guaranteed performance. Mm. And then, I, I mean, I would just have that instead of my HTPC. Yeah, the thing is, you get all those... You know, things with, you know, all the, the pitfalls of PC gaming, right? Whereas that we have no problem PC gaming, right? Ah, but the reference but hardware. most people out there, right? Even look at Penny Arcade. Those guys play a lot of games. Every time, like, Gabe goes to play a PC game, he's like, oh, my God, PC gaming, it didn't work, video card driver display. Yep, but then again, this is why, you know, the Valve set-top box would be such an interesting idea. Well, not interesting, because people have tried this before. They failed because they weren't Valve and or Microsoft. They were, uh, what was it called, Phantom? <laughs> I'm thinking even older than that. There were a lot of companies that tried to market PCs designed for gaming that were black boxes that you connected to a TV, yeah. and they were just all disasters. But the idea of having reference hardware that you would get a seal of approval, like this is certified to run Valve Series 2012 games. And when you make a game, you could certify it for that reference hardware. Mm. But I digress. That's a whole bunch. That, all that stuff is kind of too complex. The problem to talk about isn't necessarily your hardware requirements. Mostly, the problem is you know your software because you're running just Windows. You fuck it up because you're a fuckhead. That's why either you Valve installed makes a, some stupid shit on there, and now your games don't. That's work. That's why either Valve makes re, you know a set top box that is semi locked down or at least fairly referenced hardware and software or maybe their own OS you don't know what they're doing everyone do. cracks it because they want to pirate and or no. steal and or cheat uh, and now everyone's fucked up no cuz if they crack it the people who crack that stuff are the people who don't have problems no, with PC gaming no it's the opposite the people who crack everything are the people with the most problems cuz they cause the problems by cracking and then they complain that it broke because they cracked it like who most of the people who complain about PC gaming that I run into either are Unrelatedly, doofuses running like the obviously Trojan, like Photoshop. <laughs> Uh, the obviously Trojan, you know, pirate hacks I downloaded that because I was too dumb. Anyway, they they can handle that, I think. Uh, but two, Microsoft could push it, but I I don't know what Valve is actually doing because they haven't said. All we know is they're looking at hardware. Hopefully they're going to make some controllers. <laughs> <laughs> When's that D-pad patent expire? <laughs> I think it did. <laughs> Just people don't make D-pads. I don't know why. But anyway, briefly, things of the day. So we we're just talking a whole bunch about Portal. And I found this pretty funny video of two people playing Portal in the classic shtick of one of them sarcastic but kind of smart. But kind of a dick. And one of them is pretending to be dumb. Or, or he is kind of dumb. He's pretending to be really dumb. But uh, it's animated pretty well with the Pony Sisters, and it's actually really goddamn funny. It's kind of funny. It's clever. Yeah. it. I really enjoyed it. Like, I I started watching it. I was like, ah, this will probably be okay funny. And I laughed out loud a couple of times. It's which, that kind of, you know, funny like Jake and Amir, which is not funny to me. I it, find Jake and Amir to be utterly hilarious. I don't like it when someone is intentionally stupid. You know, kind of well, funny. Well, you have the situation of you cannot watch fiction where there's a character who is not intelligent. They just can't be really pointlessly fake stupid. What do you mean fake stupid? Some people, Scott, are that stupid. But not pe stupid people are not stupid in that way. Sometimes they are. No. I don't think you've met enough only, stupid people. Okay, only like Ralph Wiggum, right? Ralph Wiggum works, <laughs> right? Anyway, so check this out. This I'm a, checking. Atlas, you know, is a is a company. If you don't know that, it, you know, they make a lot of you know really really nerdy Japanese kind of games, and occasionally those games come out in the U.S. Usually for portable systems, at least lately, DS, PSP, and such, right? Uh, and I, I've usually found that Atlas games, like on paper, are so awesome, and stylistically, they're so awesome. Japanese anime manga styling, so awesome, and you want to play them. But then when you actually play them, they're so Japanese, you don't want to play them. Well, remember that time we saw that uh, we saw an opener 
to what looked like an anime. And we were like, this looks like the best anime. And then we found out it was a shitty fighting game. Right, so I don't think that that is Atlas. It might no, no, been. I'm just saying that that happened to us. Yeah, that game was called Air. Eretz Vaju. Eretz Vaju, yeah. Right, it was called something else in the U.S. Um, but I don't know if that was Atlas or not, but this game is Atlas, and it's called Growlancer, Wayfarer of Time. And I don't know what kind of game it is. I guess it's an RPG. People have been tweeting about this. The opener of this game <laughs> looks like an anime from like the late 80s, early 90s fantasy style. It's like this unbelievable opener that is like traveling in a time machine to go back to the past. And it's like someone. Ma- it's like they went back in time, found an anime from the late '80s that was never actually produced, brought it to the present, used all the video from this anime as the video for this video game. Now the video game is probably not worth playing, but watch this opener. Well, this oh, link oh you sent God. me. It says the genre is SRPG. I guess strategy role playing game. I've no, I don't know what SRPG yeah, means. Actually, I have no idea. It could be strategy. Usually, if it was shitty tac- RPG, would it shitty? Is that I what imagine, that stands for? I would imagine it was tactics. It would be TRPG, right? May have, well, I highly doubt that tactical versus strategic plays a factor in anyone who likes RPGs, except us. <laughs> And even then, uh, those words don't mean what you think. Whatever, they mean, but my, I digress. Gu- my guess is not a game you actually want to play, unless well, you're that kind of like how you're Scott. the you're that kind of person who likes to play the incredibly Japanese games, like you know, uh, Super Robot Tyson Ty- or so remember, what's the one with the maze, the maze one? Oh, 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 Etrian Odyssey. Etrian, if you like that kind of game, then you'll probably like this game. So uh, I, I recall for you, Scott. Remember a time we saw a trailer to a movie. That was a remake of Kashan or Kashern, the robot hunter. That's right. And that trailer looked like the greatest movie of our generation. That's right. That movie was one of the worst movies of our generation. It was indeed. Eclipsed only by uh, that movie that wasn't actually made because M. Night Shyamalan died, Avatar The Last Airbender, which is literally the second worst movie I've ever seen. Mm Mm-hmm. So we'll see. Just watch this opener and uh, we'll tell you if the game is worthwhile later. So, very briefly, in the meta moment, we will be at Kineticon doing our thing, running the panels department. We'll be at ZenkaiCon doing uh, our thing. We were thing. already at ZenkaiCon. Oh, by the time the show came out? Yep, Mr. Uh, Ruining the Illusion. I'm the illusion ruiner, you know this. Yeah, I could just you cut that out. You are always trying to make illusions, and I'm always trying to dispel them. I'll just cut that part out. Yeah, don't. <laughs> and we'll be at PAX Prime and all that other stuff, but that's down the road. It's summer. Uh, I'll be in Turkey next week. Why are you listening to us and not going outside? Why are you listening to us and not uh, preparing for PAX? <laughs> you should have already bought your badges. You should have. If you haven't bought your badge already, just, you know, you don't deserve to go, so don't go. So, we were, uh, we were at a board game night, Nerd NYC. Uh, Scott got there a little bit before me. And when I arrived, he was playing a game. And I just want to say that if you don't know what this game is and you see some people playing it, it looks ridiculous well, in the terms thing is, of complexity. Right, so all you have all these different colored pyramids of different shapes and sizes, and I had seen these pyramids at game stores they in the They were millennium, past. and they were always like stupidly expensive yeah, for pretty like much, giant packs of them. Pretty much every game store in the world I've ever been to sells these little pyramids, and in the little you know, package of pyramids is like a little piece of paper and it has some game in it. And I'm like, eh, whatever. You know, it's usually next to some, like, random dice well, games. Well, some games, and... usually it has, like, a whole ton of games in them because they're the Ice House pieces or the uh, Looney right. Labs pyramids. That's, that's what they're known as, is Ice House pieces. And there's all kinds of games you can play with them. And if you go online, you can download, like, these packages that are, or, like, these books that is, like, 100 Ice House games, right? All these games you can play with Ice House pieces. They're just uh, pawns to use to make games. Yeah, it's, you know, and... There's a, the thing is, because they're pyramids, because they come in multiple colors and multiple sizes, there's a lot you can do with them, you know, and they stack. So the stacking factor adds even more that you can do Scott, with them. Scott, we should use them in Burning Wheel as our Arta. You can do that. But anyway, so this game that we played, you know, uh, was called Zendo, right? And apparently, I don't know, I obviously only know one game that you can play with Ice House Pieces. I read all the other rules for a whole bunch of I other games. I already am of the opinion, even after knowing the rules to zero other Ice House games, that this is the best Ice House game. Having read the rules to like 10 Ice House games, they're pretty shit by and large. Right, but anyway, so to explain Zendo, I first got to explain Mastermind, right? So Mastermind is this game, it's really old. It's actually, I think, an American game. 
and it's a code breaking game. One person comes up with a code and the code is just colors in order. So the code could be like red, green, blue, yellow. Scott, it was invented in 1970 by Mordecai Merowitz, an Israeli postmaster and telecommunications expert. Awesome. But it's based on an earlier game called Bulls and Cows that's at least more than a century old. Thank you for reading Wikipedia. Uh Uh-huh. That's that's And the way the way Mastermind works is that one person puts the code in there and the other person has to figure out the code. So it's sort of a versus game. It's like, can you come up with a pattern that I can't figure out in some number of tries? It's one-on-one. And what you do is you make a guess. So you have a whole bunch of pieces, and you put out a guess. And if your thing matches the other guy's thing, he's like, yeah, it matches. If it doesn't match, he's like, no, it doesn't match. And you got to keep trying, uh, and based on the clues you get from his answers, right, you keep going. Like, you'll know, oh, that has two correct in that one, and that one has one correct, which means that that one is definitely green in the second slot. So uh, mm. I used to play this game a lot as a kid, and uh, now that I know game theory and I look back at it, it seems pretty solvable. And you know what? Uh, just looking at Wikipedia, there are algorithms that you can just well, always solve it in six tri- guesses. Right, because it's trivially easy to solve it in some number of guesses because there's only, I think, four colors, right? But there's uh, there's one, two, three, there's four slots and a number of colors. Right. But yeah, mathematically, it's six like colors. you can always get it. Four pegs, six colors. There is a six-guess algorithm and a five-guess algorithm. Wow, that's good. Anyway, so I played this game as a kid, and we actually had Mastermind for Kids. And I got to say, Mastermind for Kids, if you're going to buy a copy of Mastermind, don't get the regular old boring Mastermind. Get Mastermind for Kids because it is the same exact game. It is not modified in any way. It is abs- it's not like when they make Monopoly Jr. and it's dumbass Monopoly, right? Or Mon- Clue Jr., which was similar to Clue and actually kind of better in some ways, but still dumbass Clue. What, what exactly is it called? Because I have a list here of all the variations and re-releases. Mastermind for Kids. Uh-huh. The reason to get Mastermind for Kids yep, here it is because is the same exact game. Except- no, it only has three holes, not four like real Mastermind. What? No, I remember the one we uh, had. Wikipedia says you're wrong. My memory must be wrong. But I remember having four holes. I'm glad I said the words, Mm. Wikipedia says you're wrong, and your immediate response was, well, my memory must be wrong. (laughs) Not (laughs) Wikipedia? Really? (laughs) Some guy on the internet? I remember there being four colors. I'm going to look it up. Four holes. Anyway, the reason that I thought it was better, if it is indeed the same game, is because... It Three has, holes. It has a style to it, right? It's not elephants ju- and hippos and lions. That's right. It's not and it's just, shaped like a dick. It's not with, with a gland. That's right. It's, it is a penis. It's not just boring colors. It's like it's animal, a penis monkey, with hippo, on it. right? And it has a style to it. Scott, this game's a dick. This is why you <laughs> like it. Look at this. Look at this game. Any, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's only- the version we had. <laughs> So I remember it having four holes. So Scott, I got to read this to you because the five guess algorithm is really simple. Yep. One, create a set S of the remaining possibilities. Now, there are only 1,296 anyway. So pick anything, right? The first guess is AABB. Mm. Remove all possibilities from S that would not give the same score of colored and white pegs if they were the answer. Mm. For each possible guess that remains, not necessarily in S. Okay, so for each possible guess, calculate how many possibilities from S would be eliminated for each possible colored white score. So this is not trivial to do in your brain. All right, so there is another algorithm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, that you can do in your brain. That's the six guess. Yeah, six guesses in the brain, five guesses if you're Rain Man. If you're, or a computer. One guess if uh, your mom's wearing glasses and you can see the reflection. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Anyway. Thing is, so, I thought I was so clever. I thought my, my parents would be like, he's a genius. No, they were like, he must have cheated. The point of Mastermind is the other guy picks something, and it's like you, it's like 20 questions, right? It's like you slowly get more information as you guess, leading up towards guessing the correct answer the other guy's thought up, or failing to do so in the given number of guesses and then losing. So Zendo is the same thing, but slightly different and way better. The way it works is this. One person is the game runner, and they come up with something, or they look in the book and pick something, right? And there's different levels of difficulty. That is the Buddha nature. Now, we're, we, there's this whole, you know, the guy who taught it to us and played it with us, there's this whole sort of metagame of... 
people who run it a lot aren't supposed to say like what constitutes the levels or anything, and you kind of figure that out. Like, like so the the cone master will say something like, "This is a level three. Yeah, they don't have to tell you cone. what level difficulty it is or not, right? But anyway, so every cone has different properties, right? It has its size, it has its color. It has number of pips on the side of it. Which corresponds to the size. It does. So a big one has three pips, and a small one has one pip, and a medium one has two pips. It can also be la laying on its side, which means, and because it's a pyramid, even though it's laying on its side, it could be pointing in different directions. It could be not on the table if it is stacked on another pyramid. Yep. It could be pointing at a pyramid. It could be covered by a pyramid if one is stacked on top of it. It could be covered by two pyramids. It could be pointed at another pyramid that itself is not touching the table. Right. So what happens is at the very beginning of the game, the game runner, the master, right, and everyone else is the student, and the game runner is the master, decides on what is the Buddha nature. So the Buddha nature could be something like at least one pyramid is green. So they would produce a set of pyramids in some configuration that is the Buddha nature, meaning there is at least one green pyramid in it, and they would put next to it a gem signifying that that set has the Buddha nature. Typically a white stone. Yes. Then they will produce another set using any number of pyramids in any configuration that does not have the Buddha nature. So in this example case, there would be no green pyramids in that set whatsoever. Then... Player one, and this is where it gets better than Mastermind because you can have a lot of players guessing, right, in a round. Player one produces a set of pyramids and lays them out. And then he has two choices. He can either say student or master. If he says students, well, yep. well, we'll do master first. If he says master, the master will then place a stone next to that set signifying whether that set does or does not have the Buddha nature. Now, it's very the best way to play this is to kind of get into the theme a little bit and be very formal, like master. And Wise the master, master does this set, you know, not even e just exhibit most people the, Buddha the way, nature. you know, reading around the internet, people usually just say the word master. And then the master will silently place the white or the black stone. Mm. And that is the only interaction. That's good. Anyway, then after doing so, right, because you would never, you could do before doing so, but there's no reason to because you can always get the free guess. You can use your guessing stone. How many guessing stones does everyone get? Two? Everyone starts with, I believe, one or one. two. One or, so you have a guessing stone. There's different sets of right. rules online. For if you, this kind if of game. you use the guessing stone, you would guess at the Buddha nature. So if you put your guessing stone, you could say, the Buddha nature is at least two greens. If right. it, or if and only if the number of blue pieces touching at least one green piece is odd. Yeah, it could be or the number of pips on all the pyramids combined is a prime number, right? You know, or the su the you know the square of all the pips combined is you know larger than a hundred, something like that. And then you know what would happen is a either you would win because you guessed correctly. Or B, the master would then produce a set of pyramids that is contradictory to the thing you just said. So either it is an example that breaks your rule but still gets a white stone because it has the Buddha nature, or something that does not have the Buddha nature but that perfectly meets your rule. Now, this is why this game is so fascinating. You can't cheat as the master because that will become immediately apparent to the students. Yep. And because that everything has to be consistent. And if you come up with a rule for the Buddha nature and a student comes up with an equivalent rule, the master, that, that counts because the master is unable to refute the rule even though it's worded differently. So it gets you out of that sort of fiddly wording problem because at, the, at its core, it's inductive reasoning. Right. So, you know, for example, let's say the Buddha nature was, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, there are no red pieces. There are no red pieces, right? And the other guy says there are only pieces that are blue, green, black, or yellow, right? Well, obviously those are equivalent or, or rules. Or here's, here's a more sidelong example. My, my guess for the there are no red pieces is there are no pyramids pointing at a red piece. Ah. That is an equivalent rule because how is the master going to refute that? There are no pyramids pointing at a red piece. You know, I guess, yeah. So it's, you know, you come up with pretty much the same rule, you know, or an equivalent rule that a contradictory example could not be produced. 
Anyway, so you go around the table and you make, you know, you you play. And if you want to use your guessing stone, you can guess. But if you fail at guessing, you lost your guessing stone. And now you can't guess again. So if you figure out the answer and you don't have a guessing stone, you're fucked. So, Scott, how does one get more guessing stones? Well, instead of choosing master, you choose students. So you produce your set for free at the beginning of your turn and you say students. And then everyone puts out a hand. Everyone with a black or white puts stone. out a sealed hand. And in that sealed hand is a black or a white stone. Guess, and it's a guess. There, every student guesses whether the you know, set you just produced exhibits the Buddha nature or not. If they guess correctly, they receive a guessing stone. If they guess wrongly, they don't receive a guessing stone. But th this can be a little dangerous because you're giving everyone else the opportunity. For example, say someone else is closer than you, you might give them a guessing stone because they guess better. And in fact, if you're closer, the odds of guessing correctly and getting the guessing stone when someone chooses students are much higher. Now, the other thing is, this is where it, it gets interesting, you might notice that someone else, the shapes they made or the cones they made on their turn seem to be testing certain things and they guess right on a couple of students in a row, you could figure out that they're clearly on the right track and look at what they were constructing and asking the master. Mm -hmm. So you're interacting with the other players and their tests. For example, you might be close, but you might not want to do a certain test because it tips your hand. If you think that you're on the right path and no one else is, you don't want to do a test that makes it obvious you're testing color, for example. Mm -hmm. So the game gets really interesting in that level. But in the end, it's just pattern recognition. Yeah, it's pretty much, it's the same game as Mastermind, only multiplayer and much more complex because there are so many more factors that go into it. Now, usually people play with a set of ground rules, like if you make a guess like there are only blue pieces next to yellow pieces, if whatever, 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 there's a thousand qualifiers, the master can be like, that's ridiculous, I'm not even going to take a stone. Yeah, and the thing is... The master isn't going to choose something for the Buddha nature that is so complicated, right? Well, he could, but only if all the players are on that level or are really willing to deal with that. Yeah, who's going to be a jerk and be like, yeah, the Buddha nature is at least one blue pointing at a yellow, at least one yellow pointing at a green, at least one thing somewhere that's stacked, at least two pyramids laying down, and all the pips add up to an odd number, and there's no green. Now, more importantly, it's like, who's gonna there come are up with no this? situational conditions like... The player, you know, who the player is or what time it is or anything. It's just the pieces. Yeah, that would be absolute bullshit, right? And in fact, how most you, people... Because you have to be able to look at all the sets that are out on the table as examples, right? As you play, you know, just like in Mastermind, every set you play stays out on the table unless you start to run out of expensive pyramids. Now, more importantly, the way people play this game, too, is you can use anything. You could use just any random assortment of bits as long as they're reasonably consistent with one another yep and you define the ground rules ahead of time when you're playing with a given group as to what is and is not a state as far as far as the game for example when we were playing you could put a pyramid pointing at another pyramid but it did not matter where it was pointing only that it was pointing at the pyramid or at no pyramid yeah or what it didn't matter what direction it was pointing either yes yep. and you could not put a pyramid inside of a pyramid there was pointing at not pointing at on the table not on the table laying down standing up but there was no like in a, a, a small pyramid inside yeah. of a big pyramid was the same as a small pyramid pointing at a big pyramid yeah, before but the game we decided what was going to be a factor like let's say you could have a game where you said listen the only things that are going to be a factor in this game are color and size nothing else matters Right? So it's like, oh, so arrangement doesn't matter. No, so green, green, blue is the same as green, blue, green if they're all the same size. Right? But, you know, medium green, medium blue, big green is different than medium blue, medium green, medium yellow. Right? Because yep, so, color I mean, and size matter, but nothing else. Yep, so because the order didn't matter, order only mattered if things were pointing, and then it was just what's pointing at what. Right, so you determine before you start which factors come into play so you can, you know, limit the set of things you have to test for when deciphering the code. Uh, and yeah, this is crazy fun because... You know, everyone's sitting there racking their brain going, what could it be? What could it be? And you try something you think is clever and then you think it's the Buddha nature and it's not. Or you think it is or you think it's not. And it is. We you had go, a really, oh. really good master, too. He's obviously played this game a lot. He invested in these fucking expensive pieces of plastic. I tried to buy them online. So the cheapest way to get them in bulk that we can find. I did a lot of research. You couldn't find used ones on eBay or... Yeah, I didn't find anything like that. Also, I realized in my whole life, you know, I've bid on stuff on eBay. 
I've never actually bought a thing on eBay. I've actually bought quite a ever a, a nice bunch of stuff on eBay in my entire life. Okay. But I will link to there's a game called Ice Dice, and it comes with a total of thirty of these pyramids and costs about fifteen to that, seventeen dollars. That's not thirty sets of pyramids. That's thirty pyramids. The sets of pyramids themselves cost twice as much per pyramid. Yeah. So you were best off buying this crappy ice dice game and you get a big bag and all these pieces and some weird dice. So when I say a set of pyramids, I mean, right, one red, one small red, one medium red, one one big, right, all the same color. That's a set, right? So how many colors are there? There's like Well, there are different we play with five colors, I believe. Yeah. But there are other sets uh, of colors. Uh uh and I didn't get those. Like, there's a Xeno set, and notice how some of the advanced cones have I- the idea of a, quote, strange piece. Uh, the, you, this game can have as many dimensions of Buddhiness as right, you desire. Right, but between five colors, right, you know, red, green, blue, yellow, black, I think are the colors, yep. right? Uh, three pyramids each, so that's five times three is 15. That's 15 pyramids. If you buy a copy of Ice Dice, you get, you know, Two blacks of each size, two reds of each size, two yellows of each size. It's not a lot of pyramids. You know, you need to spend, it's crazy money to get a lot of these pyramids. But if you think about it, you know, it's like, okay, you don't really need the pyramids. You could make these, you could do whatever, but... You want the pyramids. You want the pyramids. And two, even though they're seemingly crazy overpriced and stupid, and Zendo seems to be the only good game we've discovered to play with them yet, there are a bajillion games you can play with these. Uh, and they're just really useful gaming pieces in general. So it's sort of worth it if you heavily utilize them in, in gaming frequently and try to play all these games with them or come up with games it with them. It is very telling. That they're, so ver- they're such versatile game pieces, and they don't serve the same you know, uh, you know, know, uses as dice or generic pawns or other gaming pieces. You know, So they're, so they're unique. Uh, that it's so, sort of worth having at least some of them if you're not going to buy a ton of them. The telling factor as to why I think this game was good is that we were playing it for a while, and one, people kept coming up and staring at it, and you it looks see th- them, especially if you're playing, like, Master, and then a stone comes out. Students, stones come out. This game is incomprehensible to outsiders, and it looks fascinating and complicated. Yep. But two, we just kept playing it, and at one point we're like, hey, should we play something else? And everyone kind of sat there. No, let's just keep playing this. Yeah. We played it for a while. But the other thing that you can do, right, is it's up to the master, sort of. Even though the master has no stake in the winning or losing, it's up to them in determining the difficulty, right? The master could purposefully try to throw you off. Like, let's say Our master did this really well. He gave what is possibly the most unhelpful set of initial examples possible. Right. So let's say we determine that... Stacking, color, size, laying down, and number of pips are all going to be factors, right? But the actual Buddha nature is no mediums, right? So I lay out something with no mediums. It's got guys laying down and pointing every which way and stacking and whatever. And I say, that has the Buddha nature. And then I lay another one down. It's just one medium has by a, itself. It has a medium. Well, that might be too no, obvious. But it's, a, it's, a media, it's a medium and a bunch of other pieces in a it's different It's a medium and a whole mess of stuff. And I say, that does have the Buddha nature. And people would be like, whoa. You know? It's like I could purposefully try to throw you off by putting all this extra information in there. And you're going to have to, over time, sort of figure out based on what does and doesn't have the Buddha nature that, oh, stacking doesn't matter in this one, even though, you know, we didn't say it beforehand, so you had to figure it out in-game, extending the game. And if the game gets really long, you either have to remove some of the sets from the table to reuse the pieces, or buy a lot of pieces. So to play a really complex, difficult, incredibly high-level game of the Zendo, you need a lot of expensive pieces. I ordered three sets of the Ice Dice, which was like 45 bucks or so. Yeah, it's a lot. you could have gotten a real board game for that money. The thing is, I think I'm going to order a few more sets of it, just because this is, these pieces will be useful, last me forever, and it is very fun to be the master. You can see the kinds of people who like to run this. This is a game. You can go to PAX, 
and you will gather a gigantic crowd who will want to play this game trivially. Yeah. And you could even come up with some variants, right? Because these play any game, right? You come up with variants where, like, you know, people could come up to the table, make a guess, and leave. And, like, you just people keep coming up, getting a line, and when you get to the front of the line, it's your turn. It's just a crazy long line, and then whoever gets it wins, and the table just keeps filling up with more and more pieces. But since everyone's in line, they don't see it till they get up there, and, like, maybe they have 30 seconds to do something. You know, anyway, I, you could come up with a lot of fun stuff to do. It's a super fun game. I highly recommend it, but it's expensive. So trick one of your friends into buying the pieces and running it for you. Or maybe find some other sort of pieces that have an equal number of factors that you can play the same game. I mean, you can do with. this with like dice. Sort like, of. If no, you, had, you need colored dice. If you had a giant bag of D&D &D dice and you agreed that color didn't matter, you could play this game. Yeah. Well, or maybe color does matter. You have a whole bunch of D. Nah, I, I say color bunch doesn't matter because usually you have a bunch of different colored dice. Right, but you could go out and buy, like, the thing is dice end up being more expensive than ice house pieces. Yes, and it's not like the old days but you might have dice. I really needed 40 different D20s. I know, right? Because <laughs> the first one wasn't lucky enough. Now I just need a sack of D6s. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>